Rohit Bhargava is on a mission to inspire non-obvious thinking around the world. He's the number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author of seven books, and he's widely considered one of the most entertaining and original speakers on trends, disruption, and marketing around the world. Rohit has been invited to keynote events in 32 countries around the world, including more than 20 in the last several weeks from his home studio. And outside of his writing and consulting, Rohit also teaches marketing and storytelling as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. We are so honored that Rohit joins us this evening. Good evening, Rohit. Good evening. I'm happy to uh, be with you and virtually with everybody else. Let me uh, let me get uh, let me get started. So, if you're not uh, too familiar with anything that uh, that I've published or anything like that, it's no big deal. Uh, I have been spending the last ten years talking about trends, and I have a book that I publish every year called Non Obvious. And uh, you know, the first time I did it, uh, actually in print, was uh, 2015, and this is kind of the original version of it. And it took off at that moment and people really wanted to hear about trends. Everybody wants to know what's coming next. And that's what I've spent a lot of my professional career thinking about and writing about. And I did something unusual with this book, which is I wrote a new version of it with brand new trends the following year. And so in 2016, I wrote a new version. One of the problems was it wasn't clear it was a new version. So in 2017, we put the date nice and big on the cover so that you could really tell it was a new version. Uh, 2018, same thing. Uh, 2019, uh, same thing. And just two, actually now three months ago, uh, the latest version of it came out, which is non-obvious megatrends. And sort of interesting timing to publish a book about trends two months before a pandemic hits. Uh, and so one of the biggest questions, among many other questions that people are asking is, look, did the stuff that you talk about, did the trends that you predicted, were they actually true? Like, did they, did they happen? And, uh, and it, we're going to talk about that. Uh, and we're also going to talk about what it takes to be what I call a non-obvious thinker. So somebody who is able to put these pieces together to see the patterns in what's happening right now and to predict what's going to happen next for yourself. Now, I know that sounds like a, a pretty tall order to be able to teach that or at least demonstrate a method for doing that in a very short period of time. But that's the goal today. And I want to show you what it looks like. So we're going to get deep into the, the whole window of how it works, of how these different trends pull together. And then I'm going to give you four specific trends from the research that I think are even more important today for you to think about whether you're thinking about it in terms of running a business, whether you're thinking about it in terms of being just being a consumer and, and a, a curious person about our culture and what's shifting. All of those things are, are um, on, the, um, you know, on the deck for us to talk about. So let me share uh, my screen so we can get some visuals in here. And what I want to talk about and what I want to show you is uh, this initial um, idea uh, talked about this, that we talk about as being a futurist. And that's usually a, a big term that, that I often hear uh, to describe people like me. And my personal confession is I'm actually not a futurist. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of futurists spend their time focused on what's going to happen 10 years from now, 15 years from now, sort of far, far future. And instead, what I focus on is what I call the accelerating present which is what's happening right now and what does it mean for how the world is going to change and what we need to pay attention to in order to be more successful or to just know what's going to happen in, in the world and be able to pay attention to it. So for me, it's not about being a futurist. It's about actually seeing the details that other people don't see. And I know we're in this moment where like everything is shifting, right? There's like extreme disruption, lots of stuff for changing. We have empty places that didn't used to be empty and it's kind of scary and one of the natural responses that i think many of us have is look we're we're turning inwards we're spending more time at home we're streaming stuff probably uh, more entertainment and and look the the world has already been changing in many ways and i think what part of what's happened is that this this disruption has really accelerated so like not only are we streaming stuff but like little michaela 
which is a virtual creation. So this is a, a example, and I'm gonna, I talk about a lot of stories. I talk about a lot of examples. So some of them you may know, some of them you may not know, uh, but the point is that, that there's a theme to all of this, and that's what I try and share, and that's what I try and focus on. So this is an image of little Michaela, which is a digital, digital. Uh, avatar. So it's something that's been created. Oh, we got a little echo. So if somebody can um, maybe go on mute just so we don't get that, thanks. Um, so this is a digital avatar. And essentially it's created by designers. So she's not real, but she has a real life boyfriend. So the guy in this picture is real. And there's a storyline progressing for little Michaela's life on Instagram where she goes out with uh, this guy and then she breaks up with this guy and people are watching it almost like a digital soap opera. And that's a new form of entertainment. There's really extended versions of this. So this guy in Japan is dangerously happy with his holographic wife which is a real product that you can actually buy with a monthly subscription for companionship uh, that already existed, again, in, in Japan, that was already there. Still in Japan, you've got uh, baseball games where people can't necessarily go to them, so now you have robot spectators for baseball games happening right now. Uh, in Singapore, this is a story from this week, uh, there was a robotic dog that they started using to encourage people to keep their socially distanced, appropriate social, social distancing. So the robot would wander around the park and if people were getting too close it would actually uh, say remember your social distancing please keep your distance away from one another pretty creepy but very interesting because when you watch there's actually a video of this too and when you watch the video what's what's really interesting is that there's two kinds of people that interact with this dog one type of person runs away because they're just too creeped out the other type of person kind of looks for a good vantage point to get a picture or a, or a video of this thing because it's just so unique and so different. It's just really interesting to see the human reaction to these things. But these are all examples right now of like how our world is shifting, how disruption is happening. There was a company two years ago uh, called Applestone that came out with a vending machine where you could buy fresh meat through the vending machine. And as you can imagine today, this company's taking off. This whole vending machine for meat, which seemed like a futuristic, weird idea that nobody would do. I mean, who would buy their steak from a, from a vending machine? But now it seems like the ultimate convenience and great. You don't even have to go into the grocery store. You can just get it, vend it out, perfectly safe. It's ideal for the world right now. People are creating wearable hand sanitizer. So now it's almost like uh, Spider-Man style. You know, you can shoot the hand sanitizer into your own hand and maybe... Uh, shoot other people who think who seem like they might need some uh, and we we know who those people are uh, you can shoot them too so like there's there's products like this that are coming out I mean there's there's fashionable face shields uh, that people are making too and uh, and one of the things that that is is on everyone's mind is like how are we going to greet each other right I mean and how, we can't we can't hug we can't touch can't handshake so like maybe we need something to like replace the handshake like what's going to be what, what are we going to use in place of the handshake? Like maybe jazz hands, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully not jazz hands because like this guy looks dangerously happy in his animated GIF with his, with his jazz hands. But I think a lot about these, these changing examples and I, and I use them very intentionally, not to show you this wild and crazy stuff that could never happen, but to show you what's already happening right now in different places. Now, some of those you might have seen, some of them you might not have seen, but that's not really the point. The point is that what was disruptive and seemed far off is much closer now. The acceleration is happening much faster. We always had, well, not always, but for at least 10 years, we had distance learning. You could learn from home over the computer, but not that many people did it because it was far off. It seemed far off. And so you would do it if you really needed to, like if you were working uh, during the day, you needed to kind of get educated at night, or if you couldn't travel, or if you had a disability. And now... All of our kids are at home. All of them are doing homeschooling. All of them are figuring it out. And so that's accelerating. And I think that when, when you put these things together and you think about like what's happening right now and what do we need, one of the things that I, that I discovered, and I actually discovered this when I watched a video that I'd seen some time ago, uh, is that there might be a very specific thing that, that we all need. And, and I discovered and, and thought of this when I was watching a video about the making of this film. So maybe you've seen it. It's called The Greatest Showman. It's with Hugh Jackman. And the, the video is actually of one of the stars of the show. She plays the bearded lady in the movie. And her name's Kiala Settle. And she is singing her, her, what would become like a really famous song, This Is Me. 
she's singing it for kind of the first time with the cast and they're in the room and they're singing it and you see this video it's on youtube actually and if you go to that url at the bottom you can watch the whole video and i highly recommend you do it because it's just it's amazing and, and any of the videos by the way that i talk about in this talk as well as all of the slides and a couple of other bonuses they're all going to be available for you at this url at the bottom so you can go there watch the videos get the slides everything like that so you can kind of lean back on a Thursday evening and, uh, and enjoy yourself. And you don't really have to take notes. You can get all the slides afterwards and you can certainly email me and I'll give you the details on how to do that. But this video, it starts off with her standing behind this music stand. And the story is that, that she really needs to, like this story, the, the song is her breakout song from the movie. And so she needs to transform herself during the performance of this song. And the director, which is the, uh, the gent that she's sitting with in this picture, he keeps telling her, like, you got to come out from the music stand. You got to emerge in this song. And she's really shy. And you can see it in her face. She's really shy about doing that. But at the 90 second mark, she does do it. She does come out. And she's really apprehensive about doing it. But right after she does it, there's a moment in the song where there's a solo coming up from another performer. And so she turns to the whole chorus and she sort of indicates that, you know, it's your turn. Like, bring the solo. It's your turn. And this guy stands up on this chair and he sings like with full energy. And it's just like, he goes crazy with his two lines of the song, right? He just totally, totally brings the energy. And right from that moment, you see something change in the room. And when she turns around, like her emotions different, she's taken all of that energy and she's now singing and she's now putting it out there. And, and when I saw this for the first time, I thought to myself, like, that's what we need. Like sometimes we just need like that guy to stand on a chair and, and just give us the energy that, that we feel like sometimes we're kind of missing, especially because we're stuck at home uh, and, and we don't get to do some of the things that we're used to doing. And like, we need that energy. We need that moment. And I think we've got an opportunity to be people like that by bringing that energy, even if we have to do it virtually. And I know it's tough to do virtually. I mean, look, I, I'm uh, used to being on stage in front of people standing up and being able to see them. And I can't see you and I can't hear you. And it's tough. But we can still, I think, offer that sort of inspiration in a different way. And I want to talk about the different way. And before I get to that, I think the picture of the world that, that helps us to do that, to helps us to be that sort of person, is something really, really valuable that I want to try and illustrate. And I call this picture of the world the modern believability crisis. And the reason why I call it this is because it's harder to know now what to trust uh, than it ever maybe has been before. I mean, Evian is just naive spelled backwards. Is it a conspiracy theory? Uh, is it real? I, I don't know, right? Because we just don't know. And I spent most of my career working in marketing. Before I was doing all this trend stuff, I was working at big ad agencies. I was doing uh, copywriting and strategy. And I was just, I was working on the marketing and the advertising. And so I know that my industry is probably to blame for a bunch of this because we've done stuff like this. I mean, we put out these ads saying more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So it must be good for you, right? Um, we have all of these ads that don't make you feel good about yourself. They, they actually do the worst, the, the, the opposite. They make you feel worse uh, so that you'll go and, and buy whatever the stuff is that they're, that they're trying to sell. Uh, this was a real ad from Levi's that said, hotness comes in all shapes and sizes. And then it shows you four women who are basically the same size. So uh, what are we supposed to think about this, right? How are we supposed to feel about this? I mean, this ad isn't even targeted at me and I feel fat. <laughs> That's the challenge. That's the problem, right? Because we see all of these unbelievable claims. I mean, Cocoa Krispies, all natural. How? Does that make sense? Is there a tree that grows this product? Like, no. So what do we do? Like, how do we deal with that? Well, maybe if we just admitted we were marketing, like maybe then people would, would get it. Maybe then people would understand. But like, that's not even enough because it's not just marketing that has caused this modern believability crisis. It's also media. And so I'm going to do a super quick test with all of you. I'm going to give you three headlines and I want you to pick for yourself whether each one is a real story or a fake story. So each story, you're trying to decide if it's real or if it's fake, okay? This is a challenge for you. You ready? And if you're sitting there with someone, make your guess and then uh, admit the truth once we reveal whether they were real or fake. So first story, chemical in McDonald's fries could cure baldness. 
real or fake? Decide for yourself. Don't say it out loud. Second story, bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. True or fake? Real or fake? And the third story, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across face with an octopus. Third story. All right. Are you feeling good about your chances for knowing which of these stories is real and which of them are fake? All right, let's do the reveal. Imagine a drum roll for yourself. I should probably put in a, a drum roll music effect. I'll, I'll, I'll do that at some point. When I get better at this, I'll do this. But until then, imagine the drum roll and then imagine the first story. Real. How can this be real? Because scientists found a, a, a chemical that might regrow hair and then some online writer says, hmm, let me Google and see what else has that chemical in it. They find out McDonald's fries have amounts of that chemical. They put those pieces together. The story headline writes itself, goes viral, boom. Unfortunately, doesn't work. I did try. Yes, I did. Second story, real bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. How crazy is this? Yes, that one's real. And if you see a pattern coming, you are probably well ahead of your time because yes, in fact, the third story, the sassy seal is real. And I'm happy to share that I do have a video of that for you to watch, go to that URL. You can watch that seal accidentally slapping across the face, getting slapped across the face with an octopus. It is a crazy, crazy video with this beautiful headline that says it was the slap heard around New Zealand. Of course it was. Unfortunately for us, there are stories like this all the time. And it is very, very difficult to know which ones are real and which ones are fake. And so all of these books have been written about this same thing. Like we don't know, how do we decide what to pay attention to? And I'll tell you what doesn't work. What doesn't work is sitting there scrolling through everything. I, I recently wrote about a word that's now apparently been added or is going to be added to the English language dictionary called doom scrolling. And doom scrolling is scrolling through stories of how we're all doomed, ongoing, forever. <laughs> and that is not a positive place to be. I mean, maybe you've been there, maybe you haven't, but like, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good place to be. We also can't count on speed reading. I mean, try and imagine looking at a screen of this happening for an extended amount of time. I mean, right now it's probably been about 15 seconds that you've been looking at this. Does your head hurt yet? I mean, imagine trying to read it that way because the, the thing is you can't get smarter by trying to consume everything. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have to be able to do something else because like imagine you were super, super hungry and instead of going and having a meal, you decided to compete in the Nathan's hot dog eating challenge. Now, when you finished, you probably wouldn't be hungry, but you definitely wouldn't be happy either. I mean, this is not the way to satisfy our hunger. And, and it leads to what, what some people call, I mean, this term that's floating out there is infobesity, which is we have so much information that is like pummeled at us that like we become obese by trying to capture all of it. Because instead of trying to do that, we need to do something else. We need to do something different. And, and what we need to do, I love how Isaac Asimov, um, famous science fiction writer, talks about what we should do instead, which is we should be speed understanders, not speed readers. If we were a speed understander, we would know what to pay attention to. And more than that, we would be more successful because if we focused on the right things, we would win because the right thing is the human thing. If we focused on the people, if we focused on understanding people and human behavior, we would win because the people who understand people always win the people who understand people always win. So how do we become a person like that? How do we do that in a way that will allow us to, to get there? So I want to share with you five mindsets, five specific ways to do that. And then we're going to talk about some trends. And the first thing I want you to do before we get into these mindsets is I want to do a little bit of a mental exercise. So this mental exercise involves you to imagine something. So I want you to close your eyes with me for just a moment. Okay, just a second. Just bear with me. Close your eyes. I'm closing my eyes while presenting. It's crazy. And I want you to imagine a flying horse. Picture where it is. Picture what it's doing. Picture everything about it. Get a mental picture. Okay. Now, for many of you, your flying horse 
may look something like this. I mean, this is a pretty, uh, um, pretty usual flying horse, right? This is what flying horses look like. Some of you might have a different version of a flying horse. Maybe your horse was doing something different. Maybe your horse was on an airplane, right? Flying around. Maybe your horse was uh, flying in some other way. Uh, you could be as creative as you wanted with this exercise because I didn't give you any details around it. But what's interesting is if you ask the same question to a room full of grade schoolers, this is what they actually come up with. And this is what they draw. And this can be a drawing exercise too, but I didn't want to make it too challenging. And, and plus I can't check to see if you're actually drawing. So there's no accountability. So I just did imagine because I, you know, we can both fudge a little bit about that. But this is what the kids come up with. Uh, they come up with a horse on a bungee cord or a horse getting shot out of a cannon or like a horse being carried away in a helicopter or being flown away by birds. I mean, it's amazing what these kids come up with. And the, the point of this challenge isn't to illustrate to you all of the things that you could have come up with that you didn't. That's not my point. My point is that if I said to you, imagine a flying horse, you're picturing something. Now, whether that horse is on a plane, whether that horse is on a, a helicopter, whatever, you're picturing something. The person next to you is probably picturing something different. And the problem is that we go into so many situations in life where we think that the person across from us knows that the horse is flying in the same way that we think the horse is flying. And so we all see the horse flying. We all know the horse is flying, but we all think it's flying in a different way. And the problem is that when we never talk about how is that horse flying in the first place, we end up misunderstanding each other. We end up thinking, well, you must be stupid because you don't think that horse is flying the same way I think the horse is flying. And that's what's kind of happened in the world, isn't it? We think that anyone who doesn't think like us must be stupid. And so we don't trust them. We don't believe them. And that's a big, big challenge. So how do we get past that challenge? How do we evolve to be better than that? Well, I believe there's five specific mindsets that help us to do that. Um, and these are the five mindsets. And as I promised you before, I'm going to give you the slides with all of these. So you don't have to struggle to kind of write them down or, or memorize them. You're welcome to take a screen grab or take a photo with your phone or whatever you like to do. Uh, or test your memory. I mean, <laughs> either way, but uh, you don't have to. I'll give you the slides afterwards and you'll have access to everything. But the five habits are be observant, see what others miss, be curious, ask questions, be fickle, learn to move on. So don't dwell on something, learn to move on, save it and move on. Be thoughtful, think about it, and be elegant. Uh, say things in, in, with the words that you intend to. And these five habits, I think, really lead to the process that I use uh, every year to come up with all of my trends. And I want to show you, I want to show you actually what this process looks like. So this is visually what it looks like, but I actually want to take you inside of it and just show you a uh, short time-lapse video of what this process looks like. And what you're seeing here is a time-lapse of the process that I use to pull different stories together, put all the pieces together, and essentially define trends in the books. And so what you're seeing here is lots of different ideas, lots of different themes being pulled together, and they're clipped together into an overarching theme. And in this case, the overarching theme is a trend that I called truthing. And truthing was the idea that we're going back to things that we know and trust so that we believe them. And all of these stories are evidence of that. And then eventually truthing turns into an outline, which then turns into a chapter in the book. So this is the process that I've used every year to essentially come up with the trends in these books. And the latest version of the book, this uh, Megatrends uh, version that I shared with you uh, a little bit earlier, has all 100 plus past trends, as well as 10 specific megatrends that I think are changing our future. And, and again, I wrote this before the pandemic happened, but when I look at some of the research, these trends have been so long in the making that they're not actually reversing they're either kind of staying the course or in some cases they're dramatically accelerating because of what's happening right now. And I'm gonna share with you four of them specifically that are dramatically accelerating. But before I do that, I wanted to show you uh, an entertaining photo from a photo shoot that we did uh, where a team of writers were talking about my process and they wanted to kind of illustrate that I've got lots and lots of ideas coming at me and I figure out what to pay attention to by curating, just the same way that a museum curator decides what to put on display and what to keep in the vault. And so this is the photo that we came up with. And we actually did this. And the fun fact about this is that you may not know is that there are different types of post-it notes 
So there are like regular post-its and then there are like extreme heavy duty post-its. And like, this is a heavy duty post-it. And if you take a heavy duty post-it, which is outdoor model and you stick it on, like, you know, it stays on. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere and it doesn't just fall off. And that is different about the heavy duty post-it notes. So there you go. You got like a little bit of a post-it note lesson. Uh, that's my free bonus uh, just for all of you guys. And by the way, when I tweeted this photo out, uh, post-it went and sent me like a whole box of post-it notes. So I was like way too excited probably about, uh, about getting those way too excited about post-it notes, but you know, anyway, um, as I said before, uh, a trend to me, the way I describe it is it's a curated uh, observation of the accelerating present. Uh, and let me show, let me share with you before we jump to, we're going to jump to a Q and a in just a little bit, but before we do that, I want to share with you four specific mega trends, uh, that I think matter right now. Uh, and for each one of them, I want to give you some stories and examples. And I also want to give you what I call a stealable idea. So how do you take this megatrend and use it in your life, in your business, in your career, in, in you know, whatever you're doing right now? Um, so how do you do it? How do you make it actionable? That's one of the things I want to share with you. So uh, the first trend is something I called human mode. And human mode was the idea that in a world where we have more and more opportunities for automation, the moments when we get to interact with someone, either physically or even virtually, uh, become more precious and desirable because we, uh, we long for them, we really want them. And so even before the pandemic, you had these amazing examples of retailers in many different places opening a slow checkout line. So a checkout line that was for people who might need a little bit of extra time and who didn't wanna go through the kiosk, the automated kiosks. And since the pandemic, all of these stores have now opened kind of early hours for seniors, uh, trying to create more human ways for, for people to get what they need uh, and have a human experience while, while doing it, uh, in addition to obviously all the deliveries and everything. Uh, you've got stars creating lots and lots of content. I mean, John Krasinski with his Good News Network, which maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, uh, the first episode of his show, I think he's up to like episode seven now. Um, but the first episode of his show is, uh, again, available in that same URL, uh, and you can watch the video from there. It's just examples of great news. I mean, good news, and he's, he's just a likable guy, and he's sharing these really great, great news. Uh, one of the stories that was in the New York Times last week was just about how more celebrities, when they're doing these interviews from home, and you can see their bookcases, uh, you can, oops, sorry, my camera. Um, has this timer on it and it runs out. So then I have to repress it. Hope you didn't panic with the countdown happening there. Um, the more you can see the celebrities in the backgrounds of their homes, the more you can uh, understand who they are and, and maybe understand something about them by looking at the books behind them. Uh, lots of virtual performances. I mean, this is a virtual performance, an example of that. And in all of these, the, the stealable idea here is like, how do we as people focus on the empathy first, the empathy of what we're trying to do, the empathy of what we're trying to communicate. Maybe you're thinking, if you do have a business, maybe you're trying to think about like, should I be marketing right now? And the answer, and I've actually done a, a couple of, of, of interviews and, and talks about this. Uh, and I believe, yes, you, you should be, but not in a way where it's, hey, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Uh, you have to focus on empathy first. What do people really need? What do they actually need? How can you be helpful? And maybe it's through content. Maybe it's through providing something that would ordinarily be charged for that you can provide for free. Maybe it's through just being uh, kind. Maybe it's through just being helpful. I mean, these are all things that we need right now. The second big trend uh, that has really accelerated right now is the idea of instant knowledge. I mean, even before the whole pandemic hit, there were so many examples of how we could get knowledge right in the moment when we need it. So everything from like just learning how to repair a toilet by watching a YouTube video to being able to watch these tasty cooking videos, which are these, these really short videos where they kind of show you fragments of uh, a meal. So they show you the ingredients and then they show you what it looks like made and you can kind of see all the details. And it's a very visual way of, of answering the biggest question that many of us have on a daily basis. What's for dinner? And these videos are great at, at helping us to answer that question. Uh, there's other amazing opportunities to, to just learn and access the world's content. I mean, one of my favorite apps right now is an app called Radio Garden, where you can uh, bring it up on your phone and you can move your finger around. And as you move your finger around, you can listen to a radio station from anywhere in the world. 
really amazing because now you can get outside of the bubble that we sometimes get stuck in of the same media, the same stories over and over again. And we can see something that's different, something that's, that's not like everything else. I mean, it's a great opportunity. And the other big opportunity is there's so much content now that's being made available for free. I mean, it's not just uh, HBO giving you HBO for, for a month free or something like that. It's, it's also all of these huge bodies of, of amazing, amazing content that you can access now, your kids can access now, your grandkids can access now. I mean, it's all available for us in this moment and, and people are willing to share it. And so we really have an opportunity to take advantage of all of that. And, you know, one of the other things that this inspired, this whole trend of instant learning was uh, my entire team was kind of looking at business guides that were out there on various topics and, and realized that pretty much you've got the dummies guides, which are uh, bloated and, and kind of useless because it's 400 pages and, and the first five pages are, let me define the internet for you. And, and like, I mean, nobody's that dumb. I get that it's a guide for dummies, but like nobody needs that. Uh, and it doesn't give you just what you need. And so we launched this entire new guide series called the non-obvious guide series. And it was in relation to this trend. So here's a perfect example of how we're taking a trend from research in one part of the company and using it to launch a whole other suite of products in response to the trend, right? So this is making the trend actionable. It's an example of that. And these are just some of the guides that are available. And just uh, a week ago, the ebook version of this guide, which is very timely for right now, uh, just came out. And in another week, the print edition of it will be out. And at the end of the presentation, or actually anytime during this presentation, you can go to that same URL that I mentioned before, when you uh, put your email address in there, you will get a free PDF copy of this entire book. Uh, so you can get the book entirely for free. If you prefer to get the print copy, uh, it'll be out uh, probably next week. So you can order it on any bookseller website you, you like. And by the way, if you are a lover of books and independent bookstores like I am, uh, please support a website called bookshop.org. So just go to bookshop.org. Uh, it's a website where you can buy books. They'll mostly get shipped to you faster than Amazon because Amazon has a big, long delay on books uh, shipping right now. And they give a portion of each sale back to independent bookstores. And they've helped raise more than a million dollars for independent bookstores across the country right now. So it's an amazing, amazing site. We're a supporter of them uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as, as a company. Um, and my publisher is also a supporter of them. And they're just, they're just great. I mean, we're not, you know, we don't get any money from it. We just want to help independent bookstores because I believe the world is better when we have bookstores in it. So uh, if you want to pick that up, you can go to bookshop.org. Uh, or you can go to the URL that I shared to share that. Um, and uh, the last piece here is just, you know, connect people with uh, knowledge to inspire them. So uh, very quickly, I'll do two more trends and then we will jump into some Q&A. Uh, if we don't get a chance to answer your, your question or if you need to jump right, right after, uh, please do shoot an email my way. I will give you my email address at the end, but it's also, I'll give it to you right now. It's rohit at nonobviouscompany.com, so super easy. Uh, and I'll also give it to you at the end. So two more trends, super fast. Uh, the first one is revivalism. And this is all about kind of bringing the old back. So bringing the things that we used to remember from the past that we still trust back to modern times. So listening to music on vinyl or Kodak making film again, or all of these remakes that are coming out. Uh, just a couple days ago, uh, Josh Gad brought together the cast of Back to the Future and they did a read of certain scenes from it. And then they had a musical number from the Back to the Future musical, which is coming soon. So it was a promotion for that. But like to see these stars all come back together on video, like just a couple of days ago. So this is like right now. I mean, how cool is that to just take that step back? Um, Heinz created the most infuriating puzzle you can imagine where every piece is identical. Uh, and it was all about kind of doing things slowly because that's how the ketchup comes out of the bottle, super slowly. But again, a retro idea, board games, another retro idea. And like this trend has been happening for some time now. And in this moment where we're stuck at home, I mean, it's become even more relevant. Like people are playing even more games. They're making even more puzzles. I mean, it, it really has run towards it. And so rediscovering the analog, like rediscovering the things that don't involve uh, our devices uh, has become really, really important and valuable. And the last trend I want to share with you is flux commerce. And flux commerce is the idea that the lines between industries and the way that we buy things has been totally shifting. So the lines that used to exist between technology and banking 
now Apple has their credit card. They're sort of breaking down those lines. Banks are opening coffee, coffee shops. I know we can't go to these coffee shops right now, but like this whole uh, relationship between these two was, was happening for some time. Uh, Crayola is making makeup because makeup is painting your face, right? So it totally makes sense. It's like a brand extension. I mean, Taco Bell had opened up a gimmick hotel where people could stay and they could order Taco Bell food. And apparently the room smelled like Taco Bell. I'm not sure why anyone would want that, but, but apparently it was really popular and sold out uh, immediately. So I guess there are some super fans of Taco Bell that want their rooms and themselves to smell like Taco Bell. Odd. You know, the whole point of all of these is, is you know, they're disrupting business. They're disrupting the way that, that things are done. Uh, and we need to learn from those examples and we can learn from those examples. So uh, the last thing that I'll share with you is, is an idea that I pointed to a little bit earlier in the presentation, which is, uh, you know, I'm, don't be a speed reader, be a speed understander. Focus on trying to uh, see the patterns figure out what to pay attention to and be more open-minded. You know, one of my favorite ways to be more open-minded, and I'll leave this with you as, as just a tip, is I'll often read magazines that are not targeted at me. So I'll read Teen Vogue magazine or I'll read Modern Farmer magazine. And the reason why I do these things is because I get to step into someone else's world. And it's not based on the algorithms, right? There's no algorithm trying to decide what story I might like to see based on what it knows about me. It's just a printed magazine. And I pick up that magazine and I get to see the stories that are for everybody. And it helps me to get outside of my own perspective. It helps me to get into a different perspective. And that's really, really important because it's super hard to do that consistently. So I promised you uh, two things at the end. One was a free copy of this new book. And if you go to this URL that you'll see right at the bottom here, you will get a free copy of the book, a free digital copy. And you can, of course, buy the print copy on uh, any retailer's website you, you like. Uh, I recommend bookshop.org, but you can go anywhere you like. And uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, I will leave you with my email address as well as that uh, URL and a photo shoot, a second photo from that crazy photo shoot. So uh, this is my email address. This is uh, the last crazy photo from that photo shoot. And I will be happy to stick around for any questions that you've got uh, or anything else that I can share with you. So let me stop the screen share at this point and we can jump into a conversation. Well, Rohit, that was amazing. Thank you very much. It was densely packed. Like your website, I really encourage everybody to go to that website. And because I've spent some time on your website and I do get your newsletter, there was one of the things I wanted you to address right off the bat is the fact that you do a lot of collaboration, you do a lot of partnering. I noticed uh, Tim Ferriss also does that. There's probably some other people as well. And I'm just wondering how you evolved to being that way. Were you always that kind of guy that worked with a lot of people? Was it a strategy you went after specifically? How did that come about? I think I was lucky because I spent so much time working in a agency environment. And when you're working in an agency or a consulting group, like you don't spend that much time on any one thing because you're always jumping from client to client. And so by doing that, I kind of became good at understanding what I needed to know super quickly. And when I left that about five years ago and started my own company and started doing a lot more, uh, a lot of keynote present presenting, usually in person, but you know, now <laughs> more virtually, um, I would do all this prep for each one of those calls. And so I'd be in these really interesting situations. Like I went to a 90 minute training put on by a, a diamond uh, company that trained jewelers on how to sell diamond engagement rings. I wish I went to that before I had gotten engaged to my wife because I would have known how to negotiate a better deal, you know, but like who gets the chance to do that if they're not inside an industry? Nobody. And so I'm really lucky because I get those experiences times like 50 a year. And so I get to all these deep dives into all these different industries and, and it really helps my perspective because I don't think things are just one way or just another. Well, you mentioned that you pick up uh, magazines that you wouldn't normally pick up like Teen Vogue, for instance. And I'm wondering if there are magazines that you picked up out of the blue that you now pick up regularly. Like you picked it up and you're like, oh, I've never read this before, but that was really good. And I'm going to check back with them next quarter or next month or whatever. Yeah. I mean, actually, to be honest with you, Teen Vogue is a good example of that. <laughs> I read that regularly and, and now it's not actually in print anymore. They moved to just digital. Uh, but I, I do read that regularly because I just find the perspective to be great. And if you are sort of a media person who's followed media, 
um, you'll know that they've really kind of staked a reputation around uh, journalism that you would not expect. I mean, you would think if you don't know anything about Teen Vogue, you'd be like, oh, that's just a magazine about makeup tips and, and boyfriends. Uh, but it's really evolved to be much more considered than that. I mean, it is, it is still targeted at young women, but it's, it's about much more than just look good. I mean, they have all these other pieces of content about like, you know, think about the world, like be an intelligent person. And so I think that's just really, you wouldn't think that uh, maybe if you didn't know it. Uh, so that's one. Uh, I think another one that I love is a magazine called Monocle, which is not really widely available in the U.S. Uh, it's actually printed now out of the U.K. It used to be printed out of, uh, or no, now printed out of Germany. It used to be printed out of the U.K. before Brexit. And um, they have all these European stories, and it's just uh, a great perspective, again, because I'm getting outside of where I live. I'm glad you mentioned that one because I have picked it up before. And when I saw it in your writing, I was like, oh, that's right. That was a really super cool magazine. So I want to go back to the first question I asked the audience, what, which was to identify trends that they were seeing emerging. And we got a lot of feedback on that, but we also got some questions around the concept of trend. And you had mentioned while you were speaking that people who understand people are the, will, will be the people who win. But I also notice in some of your writing that you identify a trend that it's not in, in like a new product or a new industry. You said it's a shift in human behavior or belief. And yeah. someone had asked really early on, isn't a trend a rejection of norms? That's an interesting way of, of thinking about it. I mean, I, I think that uh, it, it sort of brings to mind that, that whole idea of uh, the, the difference between the leader and the, the crazy guy, right? And the, the difference is that the leader has people who are following, uh, following them and the crazy guy is just off on their own. And so like you could reject the norms and just be a crazy guy uh, or you could reject the norms and have a whole following. And so like the way I think about trends and the way I describe it, and, and a lot of times people say, well, what's the difference between a trend and a fad? And the way I typically describe it is a fad is usually about a single product or a single industry. And to me, mm. a trend goes across industries, first of all. And second of all, a trend is never just one story. I mean, calling something like uh, 3D printing, for example, a trend would be the same thing as looking at flowers, eggs, and sugar on the shelf and saying, that's a cake. Well, it could be a cake if you took everything and mixed it together and made it taste good, but it's not a cake until you make it a cake. And so the way I think about trends is like they have to be curated from multiple sources, multiple stories, multiple industries to then say, hey, all of this stuff elevates to a trend. And that's what the trend is. Not, hey, I saw that one thing going by and I just, that's the trend. Like, I don't think that's how it works personally. Well, can you also address specifically how the, uh, the pa pandemic is impacting some of the trends you've recently identified? Yeah, I mean, uh, the ones I chose, like, the nice thing is when you write a book about 10 megatrends and then you present about four, you can kind of pick the ones that you know have really been taken off. So the ones I shared with you are, are the ones that have really escalated and really elevated now. Uh, and, and so that was why I kind of thought that they were important to, to share because there's so many examples. I mean, pretty much every single one of them, the examples I shared with you are all so new that they, haven't, they weren't even in the book. Like they've all mm. been kind of curated over the last couple of weeks through this weekly email that I do where I share stories. And so the examples, and, and when I do a presentation a week from now, the examples will be different. So like, I mean, that Heinz ketchup one with the puzzle pieces, like that was just from this week. Like the robotic dog, that was from this week. Like, so these are all brand new stories that are coming in based on what's happening in the world. And I'm always paying attention to that. Well, I'm really glad that you shared the example of the meat vending machines because I thought that was amazing. And it reminds me of something from your 2015 book that talked about distribution disruption. Would you classify the vending machines as distribution disruption? And do you see it for other things? For instance, when I saw that and I thought about this area, I thought how great would it be to have vending machines by the ski areas that have things like goggles and gloves and hand warmers and things. When you go skiing or snowboarding, there's so much equipment, it's really easy to forget something. 
So to have that vending machine yeah. there, right at there at the, at the base of the slopes and, oh, I don't need to go home and get, get gloves or I'm not in a, my, my day's not going to be ruined because I don't have a buff to keep my face warm. There's a machine I can get it out of. You know, what would be amazing is a vending machine where like, if you lost one glove, you could hold your other glove up to it <laughs> and they would match it. It'd be like a vending machine lost and found. That would be epic. Like <laughs> that would be really, really cool. But yeah, you're right. I mean, vending machines. Yes. Uh, that's one example. I mean, there's so many examples look like uh, getting a mattress rolled up in a, in a bag and delivered to your home. Like what Casper does instead of strapping it to the roof of your car. I mean, that's a difference in how we get the products that we now consume versus how we used to get them being able to subscribe to BMW and not buy a car, but just pay a mm. monthly subscription fee and then change your car every couple of months based on the cars that they have available. I mean, that's a shift in distribution. There was an amazing example in, uh, in Barcelona of a theater uh, that was doing stand-up comedy shows where they put an iPad on the back of every seat that would track people's facial expressions and charge them a certain amount every time they laughed up to the maximum <laughs> amount for the ticket. And then they guaranteed that their show was funny because if you didn't laugh, you didn't pay. <laughs> like, I mean, that's just a whole new payment model for a stand-up comedy show, right? So like, there's all these examples of just innovative things happening around how we pay, how we get charged, how we subscribe versus how we buy. I mean, you can't buy Microsoft uh, anymore as software, right? You just subscribe to it. Well, I'm glad you brought up the mattresses because who would have ever thought that you'd be buying mattresses online and they'd be shipping them in a box through the mail and you wouldn't <laughs> yeah. go to a store and go lie on every mattress on the store to see if it fits you. So Kim shared with us that in Alaska at the airport, they do have vending machines with socks and hats and other items like that, which I think in Alaska, mm -hmm. you, know, you could show up and be in a world of hurt if you didn't have <laughs> the right equipment there. In yes. the book, Megatrends, you mentioned under gathering ideas to seek concepts, not conclusions. Could you expand a little bit about that? Yeah, I always look at the underlying uh, theme behind a story as opposed to like, what is this story talking about? So like if, if everyone's, for example, I mean, there were tons and tons of stories of, of uh, everyone baking, right? When the pandemic started, like we all became bakers and we started making our own bread. And you could look at that and say, well, people just like eating bread. Like that's the trend, right? But like, what's the underlying human motivation that's causing us to want to eat bread, right? It makes us feel better. It's comfort food. It's, I mean, there's multiple reasons, right? But like, that's just an example of like looking behind the story to the motivation for why that story is happening. So also in Megatrends, you talk under aggregating ideas that you say, start with human needs. So it seems to me that in trend curation, there's a real psychological component to it. Yeah, I've become, I mean, over time, being in the marketing field and, and sort of being in the business of persuasion and storytelling. I mean, if you're, if you're good at marketing, uh, then that's what you're doing. You're being persuasive by telling a story. And in order to do that well, you have to understand behavioral psychology. I mean, every element of that in terms of like, why is someone motivated to believe something and trust something? Why do they, when they see reviews of a certain product, why do they trust a 4.7 more than a five-star review? I mean, it's a lower review, but like all the studies show the same thing, which is if it's 4.7, they feel like it's more authentic. And if it's mm. 5.0, it feels a little fabricated. So like that behavior all the way through to like when you're, when you, if you think back to a time when you were actually in a bookstore and you look at the magazine rack and you decide you're going to buy a magazine, you never buy the first one, right? You always buy the second one. You always pick that one up. Like, what is that? Why are we doing that? Uh, so like all of this is anchored in our psychology of how we behave. And when you start to understand that, and when you start to study it, you really do become a student of people. You start to understand people. And the, the, uh, the, the leaders and the people who are more successful are the ones who really are students of, of our behavior and who can understand that. I've heard the phrase, and I don't know if you agree with it, that technology changes, but human behavior, or, yeah, yeah, human behavior doesn't. Um, I think that on a, if you talk about sort of really broad things, like, do you love your mom? Then sure. Like, that's true. Like we have, you know, people have loved their mom for a thousand years and they'll probably love their mom a thousand years from now. 
Uh, but when it comes to their behavior for how they expect to get certain things, uh, it's totally changed uh, in, in some ways. I mean, uh, we used to stand in line and wait for stuff. And now if you are in the checkout process of an online experience and you press the buy button and it doesn't respond within two seconds and it like spins that wheel, that feels like forever. Like yeah. what's wrong with this site? How come it didn't respond right away? Like I've been waiting five seconds now, five whole seconds. Can you believe that? Right. So like, yeah, our, our behavior and our expectations in some ways, like they're always changing. Right. Um, and what we would have been happy with before, like we're no longer happy with now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it is, that's sort of a yes and no thing. Like the basic things, sure. They don't change. Um, technology changes, but yeah, like humans, not so much, but in our expectations, um, we're, they're always changing. So when you trend forecast, you don't always get it right. I know you get it right a lot of the times, but you don't always get it right. Mm -hmm. Is there, when you do get it wrong, I mean, even though you're wrong, is there an upside to looking into it or making the prediction anyway? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always, first of all, I, I am not the sort of person that thinks I'm never wrong. And as you know, in every one of these books, including Megatrends, at the end of the book, there's an appendix that grades every single past trend with a letter grade based on how it performed over time. So there's a lot of accountability and a lot of transparency behind the past trends to say, hey, this one did pan out, this one didn't. Uh, I think that there is certainly pressure to say, okay, I'm always right. And if I wasn't, uh, a lot of futurists will say, oh, well, if that doesn't seem like it's happening, I was just before my time. Like, it'll happen eventually, which is like such a lie, really, because <laughs> uh, some things just don't take off. And, and I think that what I found is when an idea doesn't take off, like, is there value to sharing it? Yeah, because look, the, the process that I use is that I am uh, looking at an observation of the accelerating present. So all of these trends, if you look at the, the kind of footnotes for each one of these trends, especially the mega trends, you'll find probably at least 40 stories that are evidence for each one with links and with kind of you know, details behind that. And the reason is because I'm not predicting something that might happen. I'm writing about something that's already happening and I'm predicting that it will accelerate and matter more. Like that's the difference, right? So I'm not trying to guess and say, oh, we're going to have flying cars in 2025. Like, I don't know that. I don't see any evidence of that right now. So what I write about is what am I seeing right now that maybe other people aren't seeing because I'm paying attention to it? And more importantly, how do I teach others how to be observant in that way so they can see those things for themselves? Like, that's what my whole mission is. That's what I try and focus my time on. Well, going back to our initial question to the audience about what trends they see emerging, one of the ones I saw quite a bit was online learning. And I know you're doing a webinar on this very topic next week. So do you have some preliminary thoughts about where we're going with learning and in particular online learning? Yeah, I have a ton of thoughts. <laughs> so, I mean, I think th there's a bunch of different things. I mean, I think that uh, one of those things is we're going to start to uh, really see a deeper separation between uh, what you might consider to be kind of book slash intellectual learning and physical experimental learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we've seen a lot, especially in, in school, like kids going to school, is they spend a lot of time in class with people doing book learning that could be done on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason why you need to sit in class and do math problems next to somebody who's also doing math problems. Uh, why not do those at home? And if you have trouble, get the help in school, right? It's, it's this idea that has been around for more than a decade of flipping the classroom. I mean, the Khan Academy was really one of the pioneers in that whole model. They said, look, watch the lectures uh, at home and do the work in class as opposed to watching the lecture in class and then trying to do the work at home on your own. Flip it around. And that model of education, I think, is starting to create more of a divide now. And I think this is going to happen in work also, by the way, where people are going to say, look, when I can go back to the office, I don't need to go back five days a week because now I've set up my home office. I know how to work from home. Like I can do that more often. And yeah, I miss my colleagues and, and no, maybe I don't want to work from home every day because I get sick of just being around this and I want my latte and whatever, right? But I'm not going to go to the office five days a week anymore and deal with that commute. Why should I? 
And imagine a world where everyone worked from home one day a week. Everyone who can, obviously. I mean, some jobs you can't. Uh, but if you can work from home one day a week, what would you do? That one day a week, you do your work. And when you're in the office, you do your meetings. So we would do way less virtual meetings because why, why should you? Just schedule the meeting for a day when you're in the office and don't do any meetings when you're at home. Stay in your PJs all day. Don't shave and do your work. Like, great. So like people are already adjusting to that. And I think that's happening on the learning side in terms of how people are learning and the expectations of the next generation. I mean, some people call them coronials, right? Like the generation that's <laughs> growing up now, uh, their expectations of education, how to be, how to go to class are, are totally different. Well, let's talk a little bit about the work environment, because that's yet another trend that a lot of people mentioned early on, that they saw more work from home happening. And I know you addressed this in your latest book, and I kind of got the impression you were saying at the beginning of the book that it's not, at least for you, wasn't ideal to do all this work from home, because there's a lot of collaboration that happens with other people. So, it, mm -hmm. I mean, do you see it as more of a hybrid as opposed to an either or? Look, I, I think it, it really depends on the lifestyle you want and who you want to be. And I think that when I looked out there for uh, advice, when this whole thing happened and everything got shut down and we were all kind of sheltering in place, I went out and I looked at all the books that were out there about remote work. Uh, and pretty much all of them had the same perspective, which is you could live anywhere and work your dream life and, and sort of live on the beach and work from there because like, why do you have to go to the office? And it was like preaching a lifestyle. And I realized that there's a huge group of people, myself included, who, like, I love to go to the beach for vacation, but I don't want to live there for 10 months out of the year and try and work from the beach. Like, that's not the lifestyle I want. Uh, and there wasn't really anything that would give me advice on how to just be effective working from home. And a lot of times what people do is they put remote work in the same category as working from home, and they're not. Uh, and one of the things I write about is, like, remote work is – that's your job. You're always at home. You're always working. You don't even have an office probably. Mm. Working from home is I have an office, but I didn't go to the office today because I'm working from home. And those are two different things, right? Those are two different working atmospheres. And when you're working from home, the key thing is how do you make that time productive, but you don't have to replace all the stuff that you had in the office because you're just working from home on occasion. And even if you're working from home half the week, or even if you're working from home four days a week and you go into the office, like it's still a different dynamic. And so I wanted to write about like, what, it, what does it take to deal with distractions? What does it take to deal with loneliness? Like, what does it take to, to be effective when you're working from home? And I had this perspective of somebody who'd spent the first 10 years of my career going to an office. And I actually physically had an office with a door. So it wasn't just like open plan offices. I mean, I actually had a real traditional office. And then for the last five years, I've been working from home. And oops, I lost my video. Let me turn it back on here. Um, and, you know, when you work from home, uh, you set up kind of the whole atmosphere and everything. And so I wanted to write about both of those things. Well, we are out of time. And I really want to thank you for spending your time with us and sharing your knowledge with us this evening. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I really encourage you to visit Rohit's website because it's amazing and has a ton of information. If you do want to check back on the video, want to go back over some of the things you might have missed, it will be posted to our website as well as Facebook. And I hope to see you next week, Thursday, six o'clock, when we welcome Dean Radin. Rohit, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, everybody.